Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And good afternoon to everybody joining us online. Thank you for being here today. Um, I wanted to start by noting a little bit more context about what we're doing here today. I think there are a few new faces in the room and many familiar faces. So if you're a familiar face, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, my name is Anna Thompson. I'm a public diplomacy officer at the US Embassy just down the road from here. And welcome to our fifth installment of the Dignity Dialogues, which is a series that we've put together designed to bring together Ukrainian and Ugandan experts on topics of shared interest. The topic of shared interest today is human rights. So with us today, we have a couple special guests uh, and a panel to discuss that topic. For those of you who've been with us before, you may notice um, that our moderator, Solomon Sirwanja, is not physically with us, but he is with us virtually, and I want to thank him for joining us all the way from Ethiopia. He's still made time to be here and continue moderating. So thank you, Solomon. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to him to get us started and introduce our panelists. But before doing that, I wanted to take a moment to introduce a guest that we have with us from the embassy today, our public affairs counselor, Ellen Massey. Um, yeah, round of applause. <laughs> sure. <laughs> And um, Ellen's just going to chat with you guys for a second about the Dignity Dialogues and tell you a little bit about herself, and then we'll get right started. Thanks, Anna. Uh, unfortunately, I have not been able to make it in person to any of these thus far, so I'm, along with you newbies, I'm going to experience this for the first time in person. Um, but my name is Ellen Massey. I'm the head of the public diplomacy section of the US Embassy, which is really divided into kind of two focuses. One is um, communications, we communicate with journalists. We communicate to the public through social media. Um, we respond to inquiries about what we're doing foreign policy wise. Um, so it's our you know, communications realm with the Ugandan people. Um, the other is public engagement, and that is all of our exchange programs, what we're doing here today, bringing people together, whether virtually or in person, um, to really just try to exchange ideas and to put Americans and Ugandans together to demonstrate where we have shared values, to uh, discuss, debate, argue, and learn from each other, um, which really helps inform hopefully Ugandans, but also Americans about kind of what are Ugandans thinking about all of these different things that we care about um, and bring here to Uganda in terms of our foreign policy? So that's what um, I do for the embassy. And the Dignity Dialogues is really just falls into the kind of, well, kind of um, bridges both of those things. But it's really about putting people together. And I think it's really incredible today to, um, and all of these uh, Dignity Dialogues that we've done to bring the Ukrainian voice here to have this conversation. So it's really more of a, of a three-way because um, this foreign policy issue is one that is so impactful across the world, whether it be through food insecurity, which I know is one of the topics that is certainly on the minds of Ugandans and one that's been talked about here, energy, human rights. We just um, commemorated Inter International Human Rights Day and a really important um, issue for all of us across the world. And so to, to take today as an opportunity to use the um, Russia-Ukraine um, issue um, concern that we all have and think about its impact on all of the different things I just mentioned, but certainly on human rights. Um, and to have somebody who can really speak to that in a very personal way and also bring it together with what I know many of you here today in the room and online are concerned about, and certainly something that the United States is concerned about, and really talk about what it means when we say, I think it's really easy for us to say things like human rights, food insecurity, energy issues, you know, but what does that really mean to all of us and how is it impacting us personally? So these are really opportunities to sit in the same space, whether virtually or in person, and have those important sometimes challenging conversations. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Solomon, for your dedication to being here with us, uh, even from Ethiopia. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to our fantastic moderator for the series, Solomon Sirwanja over in Ethiopia. 
Um, Solomon, you know how to take it from here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anna. Um, just to be sure, Anna, can you hear me? Is everything set? Just to be sure. Okay, great. Anna, thank you very much. I bring you special greetings from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. I'm attending a peace and security workshop um, for the IGAD countries. We're trying to formulate um, a framework where journalists in the region can base on while reporting and investigating uh, conflicts, peace and security. So I am really super excited to be um, online today because sometimes you always forget the online platforms. The people are online. So today I'm also online as opposed to how I have always uh, been there with you. Um, the entire team in the room, a very good evening to you. Um, thank you so much for coming for the Dignity Dialogues today. We have two special guests today. Yeah, guys in the room, I, I see you. Thank you so much for turning up for another episode. All right, so today we are privileged to be speaking about human rights in Uganda, but also in Ukraine. We have two special guests today. I want to start by um, introducing um, Mr. Uh, Robert Chirenga. Robert is the executive director of the National Coalition for Human Rights Defenders. Uh, thank you very much. He's a human rights defender himself who has over 20 years of experience in issues around human rights. He has worked with several organizations. Certainly all of us in the human rights space know him, Robert. It's always an honor hosting you. Um, thank you so much for, for making time for us today. Robert Chiranga, thank you. Thank you very much, Solomon. It's a pleasure being here. Great. Um, we also have Tatiana. <laughs> Hmm. Tatiana, you'll allow me, I I'll, hope I get your name right, the pronunciation of your name. Penchokchik, I hope that's the right one. Um, Tatiana, thank you so much um, for joining us this, uh, today. Tatiana is also a human rights defender and she's the head of the Human Rights Center, Azina, um, um, in Ukraine. And of course, she's an expert. She has a PhD. Um, and a scholar as well around issues of human rights, her CV precedes her. Tatiana, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, we've always had uh, several guests from Ukraine, so you are many, you're one among many who we've hosted on the Dignity Dialogues, where we really get to interact on different things. We've had conversations on energy, we've had conversations on the crisis, security, but really picking a leaf or two from um, from, from, from the different countries and looking at how we can collaborate better, even work together and if pick a leaf or two from different countries. So let me, I always start with this question. What is the latest on the crisis? Um, what is the situation like right now in Ukraine? Tatiana, let me start with you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Solomon, for introducing myself, and I am honored to be a speaker at this discussion and also to exchange views and information with uh, distinguished colleagues uh, in, in the room, uh, in the audience, but also those who are with us online. And thank you to Ellen and Anna for uh, introducing this uh, format. Uh, actually, um, as it was mentioned, I'm the head of the Human Rights Center Zmina. Zmina in Ukrainian language means change. And my NGO works uh, for the democratic change of Ukrainian uh, society, for rule of law, for uh, respect of human rights. We were established 10 years ago. And uh, so this year uh, we marked our 10th anniversary of our organization. We are based in Kiev, uh, but work across Ukraine, including occupied peninsula of Crimea, where uh, we were able to uh, collect the information about human rights abuses under the Russian occupation all these eight years starting from 2014. So speaking about the current situation in Ukraine, as you uh, might heard, uh, we have uh, uh, now uh, multiple attacks uh, from uh, Russian uh, bombs, uh, rockets on our uh, electricity infrastructure. And uh, from the beginning of this large scale invasion after uh, 24th of February, there were uh, 143 attacks 
on uh, uh, energy supply chains, on electri electricity power stations, uh, uh, generators, uh, and uh, this uh, the majority of these attacks, uh, three fourths uh, out of the total number, happened uh, in the end of uh, uh, autumn and beginning of winter. Uh, now uh, we have frost and snow in Ukraine, so uh, this is an obvious war crime because uh, the goal of the Russian Federation is uh, basically to uh, make us, uh, uh, to freeze us and abandon, uh, deprive us from the electricity. And now, uh, at this moment, when I'm speaking to you, I'm based in Warsaw. Uh, I am now traveling from uh, Kiev to Brussels, where tomorrow I'll be speaking at the EU uh, Civil Society Human Rights Forum. So uh, uh, basically, yesterday I left uh, Ukraine, and uh, uh, during the last uh, month and a half, starting after 10th uh, of October, uh, we have the shortage uh, of electricity, which impacts our work uh, because the electricity is provided to people only uh, four hours, six hours per day. And uh, uh, it is very difficult to plan a work because uh, the, if there is no electricity, there is no heat, no uh, mobile connection, no internet, anything. So I would say the biggest challenge that we have now is uh, to continue our work on the same speed as we used to do. Because uh, after uh, this attack, it's basically not a new for us, it's a third attack of the Russian Federation against Ukraine after uh, invasion to Crimea in 2014 and then uh, war in Donbass that Russia started also uh, after Crimea in 2014. So it's a third wave of attack. Uh, but now it's uh, much more cruel. And uh, at the moment, uh, the Prosecutor General Office of Ukraine uh, have regist has registered uh, 50, 000, uh, over 50,000 of uh, criminal proceedings based on the uh, facts of war crimes committed uh, in Ukraine. And as I mentioned, uh, 143 of them are attacks on the civilian infrastructure. I'm speaking uh, about the attacks on the electricity uh, electricity chains. Uh, and this is a uh, war crime because uh, the, it's uh, targeted, the civilian population is being targeted. And why is civilian population is being, being targeted? Because Russia cannot defeat Ukraine uh, by military uh, means. Uh, uh, Russian army, um, is kicked off from more and more Ukrainian territories. Uh, Ukrainian army is liberating more and more territories. So Russia started this massive terror against civilian population, uh, trying to break the resistance uh, of the people, which uh, I would uh, assure you would not happen because uh, this only makes people more uh, united uh, together. Uh, this brings more solidarity to people. People try to help each other. Those people who have, for example, generators, uh, they can provide for free some opportunities for others to uh, recharge their devices, uh, uh, to uh, provide them some heat. So uh, we are expecting very hard winter, uh, but uh, we will continue our resistance uh, to the Russian military aggression. Um, Tatiana, thanks for that brief. Um, it's just so good to hear that the people of Ukraine stay united through this uh, crisis. Um, there's, there's always been this conversation of, um, can you survive the winter through this uh, period? But thanks for giving us an update. Uh, but let's talk about human rights. Um, the state of human rights in, in Ukraine, especially the atrocities that have been committed by the Russian forces, we know that there have been conversations of investigations of crimes against humanity during this war, and that Russia should be held responsible, according to some observers. What is the state of human rights in, in Ukraine as we speak, and, and, and how has it manifested, especially during this crisis, Tatiana? Um, this is a, a huge challenge for us because, as I mentioned, we have uh, over 50,000 of war crimes which are registered now in Ukraine. And unfortunately, this number is not final because uh, uh, war is uh, uh, ongoing. It is on the hot stage and uh, every day new and new war crimes and crimes against humanity are continuing to, to, to happen uh, in the course of this uh, Russian armed aggression. 
And from the other uh, hand, uh, uh, these numbers uh, also uh, don't include the episodes uh, from the territories that, that are now under the control of the Russian troops. For example, uh, if uh, the such city as Mariupol is liberated, I am afraid there would be uh, new uh, hundreds, if not thousands of new war crimes, uh, which will be identified. Uh, so this also uh, for us, it means a huge uh, challenge how to deal with all these atrocities and how to investigate them. First of all, uh, I would like to say that uh, the, uh, in order to uh, uh, investigate it, but also to prevent uh, it uh, to happen again, uh, we have to understand the reasons uh, why this is happening to us. The first reason is uh, Russian imperialism, uh, because uh, uh, Russia uh, has that imperialistic uh, attitude to, towards neighbors. And uh, Russia was an empire uh, not only during the USSR times, but uh, before, uh, when uh, during the times of Russian Empire. And basically, uh, they denied the very existence of Ukrainians as a separate nation. Uh, even in the time of the Russian Empire, they called us uh, Malarosi, little Russians. So they are great Russians and we are little Russians. So that, that was the attitude to us. And now we see that this is uh, like repeating again. And the second reason is impunity, because uh, Russian Federation feels that no one can stop them because they have the nuclear weapon, because they, are, they have big army and they uh, use uh, force uh, to uh, achieve their imperialistic uh, goals. Uh, and also because they did uh, many war crimes uh, uh, before, and they were not punished, not held accountable for that. I'm speaking precisely about uh, the Russian war crimes uh, in Syria, uh, about the Russian in invasion to Georgia in 2008, about Russian uh, occupation of uh, Crimean Peninsula and the uh, uh, occupation of the part of Donbass region in Ukraine in 2014, and the multiple war crimes and crimes against humanity which uh, were happening during these aggressions. Uh, no one was punished for that, so they feel their hands free to continue, which they did on 24th of February this year. So when we speak about the accountability and justice, uh, we have to understand several things. First of all, that this uh, accountability is a, a domestic task for Ukrainian state and for Ukrainian domestic uh, justice mechanism. Because when we have tens of thousands of war crimes, none of the international courts can uh, deal, can cope with such a huge amount of, of crimes. Uh, now we have the investigation which is opened by the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which is situated in The Hague. But uh, like we, uh, we, we understand that ICC uh, uh, would take only some episodes, I don't know how many, but maybe 10 or 12 or 15 cases out of tens of thousands. Uh, and the question is who will be investigating the rest? The rest uh, is uh, put on the domestic uh, investigators, prosecutors, and we have a unique situation when during the active stage of the war, a lot of things uh, are already documented by the civil society organizations, human rights organizations like mine, who are staying in Ukraine and collecting all the evidences, and by the legal mechanisms, by the uh, police, by the prosecutors. And at the moment, uh, we already have uh, 16 verdicts uh, in Ukrainian domestic court. Uh, which are uh, based on the uh, facts of war crimes committed in Ukraine. Of course, 16 verdicts, uh, criminal verdicts in domestic courts is uh, not a huge number uh, compar in comparison to, to tens of thousands of, of war crimes which are committed, but it's the first, like it's still the, the beginning, you know, the first stage, and still uh, we already have these court verdicts. But, but, uh, uh, here it is important to understand one more thing. Uh, there is also the, the we at the domestic level in Ukraine we cannot bring to accountability uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, top leadership of the Russian uh, Federation, because uh, they have diplomatic immunity and they cannot be 
brought to, to Ukrainian court. Uh, they can be uh, only uh, brought to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, to the ICC. Yes, but but the ICC, uh, there are four key main types of uh, the international, the gravest international crime. So first is war crimes, then crimes against humanity, the crime of genocide, and fourth is the crime of aggression. And out of these four types of key international crimes, uh, ICC has jurisdiction over Ukraine uh, with regard to three types. It's a crime of genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity, but not the crime of aggression. So even in case when ICC, uh, for example, uh, investigates some cases and uh, uh, some people will be brought to justice, uh, those would be for, for war crimes, crimes against humanity, but Russia will not be punished for the very fact of starting this unprovoked aggressive war against Ukraine. That's why uh, now Ukrainian civil society and the Ukrainian government is advocating for the establishment of the special tribunal on the crime of aggression uh, committed by the Russian Federation against Ukraine. Because we believe that the Russian, uh, that aggression is a mother crime. It's a principal crime, if there would be no aggression and attack of Russia against Ukraine, there would be no following uh, crimes against humanity and, uh, and war crimes. That's why I hope that such tribunal uh, will appear. And uh, at the uh, current stage, uh, the political consensus is being built up again, uh, around the idea of the establishment of such a tribunal. We have uh, several uh, regional uh, resolutions which were uh, adopted by the Council of Europe and by the European Parliament in support of the establishment of the special tribunal on the crime of aggression. Uh, and also uh, this resolution now, I hope it will be presented in the U United Nations uh, General Assembly. And when uh, the ANGA supports uh, as a, like a global community, supports the idea of the establishment of such a tribunal on the political level, then we expect the, uh, some concrete steps of uh, how this tribunal will look like, uh, uh, which uh, resources will be used for, for the creation of it, at which city it, it will be situated. But I hope that such such a tribunal, it's a, like a missing element in all the system of international justice, and we advocate for the establishment of such a tribunal. Um, Tatiana, thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive overview. Um, I know that there's been a lot of evidence that has been collected to support uh, potential crimes against humanity and, and war crimes. Uh, we'll come back to you uh, just shortly. I would also love you to um, perhaps listen to the state of human rights in Uganda. Um, Robert, what is the situation like in Uganda? Could you perhaps paint a picture of uh, the state of human rights in Uganda? Robert. Thank you, Solomon. And uh, thank you, Tatiana. Of course, we would want to, on behalf of uh, the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders and the entire Human Rights Defenders Fraternity express solidarity with human rights defenders in Ukraine. Uh, that uh, the situation that they, have, they find themselves in, which is not a situation that was created by them, is not a good one. And we all hope that we can see change, the effect that uh, their human rights and dignity can be restored. So we sympathize with the Ukrainian citizens and all those forces who are trying to resist this act of aggression by their neighbor. Now, the state of human rights or the situation of human rights in this country can best be described as one that fluctuates. Fluctuates in a sense that there is a time when human rights issues are at the peak in terms of abuses and violations. If you look at the 24th annual report of the National Human Rights Institution, the Ghana Human Rights it talks about all sorts of violations that occurred. But when do we really see human rights violations and abuses? When we are addressing human, uh, when we are addressing political questions, when we are having an election, you know that 
in the last year in 2021 when we had elections that's the time when we had the highest number of a certain age group participate in an elections what one would call those who enjoy what we call the democratic demographic dividend the youth young people and when they came out to exercise their fundamental rights and freedoms especially in determining who shall govern them hell broke loose so the state of human rights in this country keeps fluctuating when we have a political question we are addressing and when i talk about a political i'm talking about an election basically you will tend to see human rights especially civil liberties shoot so high if you ask me so what are those rights or fundamental freedoms that are at stake right now they have to do with more of social economic rights that young people need jobs they can't see jobs people need to access medical health or medical facilities or drugs they can't get them livelihood wages are after the covid pandemic you've seen many companies cut down on staff so meaning recently nbs laid down about how many staff almost 100 or plus so issues to do with welfare well-being are now at stake but does that mean there are no civil political rights being abused over they are there you still hear allegations of abductions don't we we've heard of abductions of muslims so they are still there but they are not to the level when we are addressing a political question such as an election civil liberties are really under fire or at stake when you are addressing so the situation keeps fluctuating numbers may be low but there are still serious human rights violations and abuses occurring and we need to be very important here when we talk about violations and abuses we are not referring to the same thing that abuses are human rights that are under attack as a result of non state actors isn't it fellow individuals who are not employed by the state and then violations so violations are those that occur as a result of official state actors you have a policeman you have an army man who is violating your rights but me as a private citizen i can also abuse your rights and therefore when the state fails to come and protect you as a result of me abuse the intimacy has failed in its duties so the state of human rights in this country is such that at times we've seen where the state has failed to fulfill its tripartite obligations and what are the tripartite obligations one that the state has failed to respect your fundamental rights and freedoms here means that it has interfered with your enjoyment of your fundamental rights then protect that the state has failed to protect you from any other third party and we have seen these instances i'll cite examples when you have mob justice you have border borders turn against you either because you are you had a a, a a disagreement with them and mob justice comes on you and the state is not there to protect you then the one which i really think is really failing as we as we talk now is the obligation to fulfill the obligation to fulfill requires the state to put into measures an enabling environment for young people to be able to enjoy their full potential young people who have graduated from school that they are able to get jobs or employment and are able to work in a very decent uh, working environment so we still have such situations where we find that really the state has failed on its tripartite obligation of respecting protecting and fulfilling and fulfillment by the requires uh, includes imposes on the state another another obligation the obligation to provide what does the obligation to provide mean that no citizen should die of hunger where you have a government but we have had instances where our fellow citizen karamoja have died of starvation haven't they yeah where citizen die of starvation and you have a government that means that the obligation to provide food to the most vulnerable has failed they have, the state has failed so the situation of human rights in this country is one that fluctuates depending on the circumstances right now as to of course you can't compare our situation to ukraine ukraine is in a period of war there is an act of aggression by a neighboring country right now we have some relative peace and when i talk of relative peace we should be careful that 
the presence of peace does not mean the absence of war. That the fact that LRIA has been pushed up to Central African Republic does not necessarily mean there is peace. If you slept without food, do you have peace? If tomorrow you are sick and you can't afford medical care or you can't access medical, are you, do you have peace with yourself? If your brother or sister can, has not been able to go to school, do you have peace with yourself? If you have no food at home, then the gap between the haves and have-nots is widening. Those who really have, have. Those who don't have are struggling every day. Not everybody can afford to go to town even with the cheapest means of transport, whether it's a border border or it's bus. So the social economic conditions are leading to serious human rights violations or issues where the state has not come in to provide an enabling environment. So we are in such a situation that human rights really fluctuate. Uh, in comparison to uh, our colleagues in Ukraine, the situation there of course cannot be compared to us because theirs is worse. The, you, you can't comprehend the destruction and wonder who is going to be responsible for rebuilding Ukraine, the lives of elderly people, the most vulnerable. When you see someone telling you, a 64-year-old woman telling you, how do you start a life again? You are already retired. Your home has been brought down completely. It's now mortar and ashes. How do you start a life again? At least you young people, you have hope that I'm still energetic. If government creates an enabling environment for me, I may be able to explore my full potential. But we're talking of 65 year old people, women who are now widows, orphans who are just left there at the mass of God. Now the worst thing is now the energy crisis that Russia decides to target installations where you'd expect some level of resilience by Ukrainians. If they destroyed the Chira Dam and they destroyed uh, Karib Karuma and they destroyed all Umeme stations here, tell me how you start a life. Where will you get kerosene? You don't manufacture kerosene here, you import it. Where do you start a life? Even candles, that wax is imported. Where do you start? So really you sympathize with the people of Ukraine and find that we cannot compare the human rights situation. Yes, human rights defenders here have first, I would love to know from Tatiana, what was the situation of human rights defenders in Ukraine prior to the act of aggression by Russia? Uh, perhaps before Tatiana can come in, um, Robert, we've had several abductions. I don't know if it was um, a miss that you forgot to talk about, but. Clearly, the situation, like you've said, in Uganda has been deteriorating. We've had several abductions through, you know, people on the streets and they're just abducted, kidnapped by the state. We've had people who have been given bail and rearrested again. We have had um, happening in Uganda. We've had families coming out to speak out about these gross violations and yet there's not been any form of accountability to the state um, in terms of who is committing these, these, these violations. Of course, we know it is the state doing, doing these violations. I, I would love you to perhaps speak a little bit more about that. There are several reports that have come out to talk about these abuses and, 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 and a lack of accountability. The people who committed these atrocities continue to walk in our streets. Some of them are just redeployed in different places. I, I, I thought you'd touch on that. Thank you very Robert. much. Thank you so much, Solomon. I think that's a, an important question. I think one thing, let me start with the contradiction that we have in this country, that we have a robust legal regime when it comes to human rights, starting from our own constitution, that we hold a whole chapter chapter four of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda as amended, that has a whole Bill of Rights. And when we talk about the Bill of Rights, we talk about the Universal Declaration, the rights that we find in the UDHR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic and Social Culture, including the group rights. So all that broad range of rights are recognized in our Constitution. Two, these countries are among the very few countries in the world 
that has ratified the most number of international human rights instruments. Are we together? But it is one thing to have a constitution and international and to implement the same that is there. Are we together? Two, abductions have occurred. They occur in broad daylight. We have a famous vehicle called the what? The drone. Everyone can differentiate a drone from an ordinary vehicle. That a Toyota Starlet, a VT is not a drone. Hmm? Everyone knows it. So it happens in broad layer. The issue is why our why is our law enforcement not following the due process of the law? The law is very clear. The criminal law in this country is very clear. If I want to arrest you, including you and ordinance, have the powers to arrest someone if you think this person is going to commit a crime. What would God prevent if arrest? But there are certain steps that you must follow. That when a law enforcement officer is coming to arrest you, the first thing he must do is to identify himself too and tell you who he is and tell the reason why he is and even has to caution you that whatever you will say at this material time, I'm going to arrest you, may it be used and therefore you can remain, opt to remain what? Silent. Because the information you speak at that moment can be used against you if we are going to prosecute you. So what I'm saying, why wouldn't our authorities, in other words, the law enforcement officers, instead of abducting, we have national IDs, they can easily go to NIRA and access all this data and rest. Two, is what I consider also as contradictions. Why are you arresting me before you do thorough investigations? Such that by the time you take me to the courts of law, you don't even seek for an adjournment. You say, I'm ready to proceed, your worship or your lordship. But you hear of people being abducted or whether they, are, whether they have been brought to the courts of law, they are again remanded or they seek for adjournments that investigations are still going on while someone is in detention. But remember, the person is in detention could be her, it would be the breadwinner of the family. In other words, when you detain him or her, many lives are affected. So the question is, why wouldn't our authorities apply due process of the law? When you are going to arrest, why don't you do thorough investigations? That are, when you arrest me, within 48 hours, you're ready to proceed? Prosecute me. So those are the contradictions we are talking about. And the best that human rights defenders can do is to continue to condemn and speak about these things. If you know particulars of this person, to speak out. The state in the most recent uh, uh, pronouncement, they said, if you know any person of yours who has been abducted or is missing, come out and identify. But the other contradiction I tell you is when the state says, we don't know. If you really don't know who is abducting, are you in charge? It is a, it is a, it's an, it's an indictment on the state. And uh, the state has all the power and control over the instruments of coercion. That me and you cannot control the police. They are the ones who control the police, the military intelligence, the intelligentsia, the army. They have the, all the means by which they can make us, force us to do what we would otherwise not have wanted to do. So it's a very big contradiction. And as human rights defenders, we condemn it because we have, as I indicated to you, a very, very robust law. An outsider who doesn't know when you read our constitution, you could say that. All right, Robert. Ro Robert, thank you. Thank you for that. I I'll come back to you. Thank you very much uh, for highlighting those. The sad thing is that these things happen. We talk about them, but there's been a general lack of accountability. I have not seen people uh, who tortured Kakwenza brought to book, for example, um, who shredded his back. I have not seen people who beat up Stella Nyanzikama. I have not seen people who recently. Um, the National Unity Platform leader, uh, Robert Chagulani, paraded victims of torture and families who have, um, haven't heard from their loved ones in Nairobi. Um, and I know that the Internal Affairs Minister, Kaindo Tafiri, has um, uh, sanctioned an investigation into the, the issues raised. Um, but they continue to happen. 
So I, perhaps the conversation that we need to have today is what are we going to do about it, you and me who are in this space. But let's go back to uh, Ukraine. Uh, Tatiana, certainly there was a report that was released by the UN, the, the UN Human Rights Inquiry that indeed confirmed that gross human rights violations were committed. And the commission chairperson, Eric Mose, um, said, and I quote, we visited 27 towns and settlements and interviewed more than 150 victims and witnesses. We inspected sites, grave, uh, 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 mass graves, places of detention and torture. And based on the evidence that we gathered uh, during the inquiry, we can confirm that war crimes and crimes against humanity were committed and that Russia needs to be held accountable. Um, it's some of the issues that are highlighted in this report were unlawful killings, including executions of civilians in more than 30, state, 30 settlements in Kiev, in Kiev and Kharkiv and the Sami region by Russian armed forces, which the report says was very, very terrible. They cite uh, issues of brutal execution, sexual violence, including children, Quite a damning report from the UN um, Human Rights Inquiry team that did these investigations. Do you think that something can be done to bring Russia to book? I mean, I know that the ICC's journey is quite long. You know, it takes years, you know, trials and trials. I mean, we've had the case of the LRA, um, LRA, you know, warlord who has been tried for years and just most recently is when he was convicted. But what do you, with such overwhelming evidence that has been brought forth by the, the UN uh, inquiry uh, team, uh, which is a believable uh, inquiry, um, what do you think can be done to, do you think that Russia will ever be brought to account for these atrocities? And what do you want to be done, Tatiana, as a human rights defender? Uh, yes, thank you, Solomon. Russia must be brought to accountability for these atrocities because uh, if it uh, not happens, uh, it means that Russia will continue uh, its aggression and uh, it can be uh, done against other neighboring country uh, or uh, expanded in Ukraine. Uh, uh, luckily, now we have uh, big support from many countries uh, in the world, uh, which provide us uh, weapon military assistance, uh, which uh, also impose the very strict sanctions against Russia. And these sanctions are tightening more and more. And this also helps to undermine the Russian uh, war machine. For example, I mentioned about these attacks on uh, Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, on electricity chains. So now uh, these are more uh, rare and rare attacks because Russia uh, almost used uh, the majority of its rockets uh, uh, in the war against Ukraine and they have shortage of uh, these rockets and they cannot produce them very quickly. That's why they try to buy these rockets from other country, uh, which is very far from democratic standards from Iran. And actually, uh, if we speak about this war, um, it is important to understand this is not just attack of one country against other neighboring country. This is also a fight of two regimes. Russia is uh, an authoritarian state and Ukraine is democracy. So, so uh, uh, globally, this is attack of uh, authoritarian regime against democratic regime. And uh, I would like to just give you also, our estimates, you mentioned about the UN Commission of Inquiry, and uh, we appreciate their work, and uh, my NGO was in contact with them several times. We met uh, with their experts who also traveled to Ukraine to document all the atrocities, and also we provided them uh, many cases that we documented and contacts of, uh, of, of those victims who suffered 
from the Russian armed aggression. And also there is uh, another UN mechanism that works in Ukraine. This is UN human rights monitoring mission that also collects information on the ground and works in Ukraine from 2014. And we also provide our data for the UN human rights uh, monitoring mission. And uh, so uh, that's true that uh, we have uh, uh, mass graves, we have uh, thousands of civilians which were murdered in this war, including 443 uh, children which were killed. And unfortunately, this is not the final number. As I mentioned, we still don't have, uh, we don't have a, a possibility to check and verify and document the, a lot of atrocities happening at the territories which are now controlled by the Russian army. But at the moment, uh, Ukrainian armed forces uh, liberated more than a half of territories which uh, were occupied by Russia after uh, 24th of February. And uh, we hope uh, that more territories will be also liberated. But also, this is very sad because with a liberation of every new city and village, we discovered a dreadful traces of, of Russian atrocities. And it, uh, for me, it looks like the first infrastructural object which they established when the Russian army occupied the city or village is a torture cells. Uh, my NGO is documenting uh, particularly the cases of abductions and enforced disappearances of uh, the active members of the local communities. These are representatives of the local self-government bodies, journalists, activists, human rights defenders, volunteers, religious leaders, uh, cultural workers. And uh, at the moment, uh, we have collected 386 cases of uh, enforced disappearances of those who, people who are leaders at their local communities. And out of them, uh, many of these cases also uh, were uh, committed with the use of torture. And out of them, 16 persons were tortured till death. Why this is all happening? Because uh, there is a huge uh, resistance and resilience to Russian invasion. And uh, when Russians occupied uh, some cities and towns, some territories of Ukraine, uh, in order to break the resilience at the local level, they deliberately uh, kidnapped the representatives of local self-government bodies, local city mayors, village heads, uh, journalists, uh, just to terrify other people and to, to send them a signal that this would, would also happen to them if they continue uh, this uh, resistance and resilience. And here I would like to come back to the question that Robert asked uh, about the state of human rights before this invasion, uh, which uh, we had in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine, uh, as I mentioned, Ukraine is a democracy, and by the assessment of the Freedom House, uh, their global assessment of the freedoms in the world, Ukraine was on the 60, 60th place in the world when we speak about the level, uh, level of freedom. Of course, uh, we have had challenges, uh, and as human rights defenders, uh, we had a lot of work to do, especially when uh, our former President Viktor Yanukovych came to power and he wanted to build up a kind of uh, authoritarian regime. But then people went to the protest uh, during Euromaidan, uh, during the winter 2013-2014 and uh, overthrown this uh, dictator that wanted to, you know, uh, seize basic rights and freedoms and to that uh, refused from the movement to, towards the EU and from the signing, signing the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. That revolution was successful, however, in the course of the revolution during the three months in winter 2013-14, over 100 protesters were killed. And after Euromaidan, Russia immediately uh, started its aggression and occupied Crimea in 2014 and started its aggressive war in Donbass, which uh, have taken the uh, lives of 13,000 of people before this last uh, wave of invasion in 24th of February 2022. And during these eight years, because as I said, we have war not nine months after 24th of February, we have a war, we are in a war with Russia, eight years and nine months. It's 
it's continuing from, from 2014. But even during these eight years of occupation and hostilities, tensions in Crimea and Donbass, Ukraine continued uh, democratic reforms. For example, the reform of patrol police was done, uh, partially judicial reform was done, the reform of decentralization uh, was implemented in Ukraine where uh, more responsibility, more power and more money were distributed to the level of the local uh, communities. And uh, for us uh, now the biggest, and uh, now as you know, Ukraine uh, also received the candidate status to join the European Union and we are on the track to EU, which means that we will implement more and more human rights related reforms. And for us as human rights defenders, it gives the windows of opportunities to push these reforms. For example, till the end of the current year, we expect the new law protecting the national minorities of Ukraine to be adopted and also the media uh, uh, legislation, the new media legislation will be uh, voted to. Also, in summer this year, Ukraine has ratified Istanbul Convention against the domestic violence on the prevention of domestic violence and investigation to strengthen uh, uh, the work of the state actor and non-state actors when we speak about the gender-based violence and domestic domestic violence. And as human rights defenders, we welcome that Ukraine, even being in the situation of martial law and then in a very uh, hot stage of the war, is still continuing uh, to ratify important international treaties and to continue its reforms. And I think it's very important for us not to stop to uh, push reform, human rights related reforms during the war, because uh, the goal of the Russian Federation is basically not only to get control over Ukraine, but also to stop Ukraine from reforming, stop our anti-corruption reforms and, and all others. And uh, which means that we don't know how long this war uh, will be continuing, but we have these windows of opportunities of time that we have to use for reform of our country. And then uh, my final maybe sentence coming back to your question, Solomon, about how to bring Russia accountable for, for their war crimes. Uh, it is important to say, you know, there are different level perpetrators who committed war crimes or who gave orders. For example, there are ordinary average soldiers and some of them uh, which were captured by Ukrainian army and later they, they got verdicts in Ukrainian courts. A, a few, but still, as I said, the investigation takes time. Then there are middle level commanders and uh, there, there is a top leadership of the Russian Federation, which is the source of all these atrocities. Of course, the most difficult part is how to you know, put the put Vladimir Putin and his close allies to the cell, to the prison cell. Uh, as you mentioned, the ICC investigation would take time, maybe five years, maybe ten years. We don't know, uh, and we don't know what happens with Russia with Vladimir Putin by that time, and if he will be the final suspect uh, defined by the ICC prosecutors and investigators or not, or they would define some only middle level commanders. We don't know. That's why, as I mentioned, it is so important now to unite our efforts uh, for the establishment of the special tribunal on the crime of aggression of Russia against Ukraine, because crime of aggression is very obvious crime. The uh, order to attack Ukraine was given by the Russian President Putin on the television. Uh, the Russian Security Council supported this new invasion to Ukraine. All evidence are on the surface, but the problem is there is no legal mechanism, no tribunal how to bring them to accountability for, for, for what they did. That's why we would like uh, uh, to uh, express our wish for more solidarity because to uh, establish a new tri tribunal, we need solidarity from all countries uh, around the world and we need uh, more support. Uh, and uh, believe me, when this, uh, like, uh, there would be clear signal that uh, any unprovoked war of uh, one country against other countries will be punished. There would be uh, also signal to other uh, countries in the world that they don't have even tried. And we will bring more peace uh, globally uh, when we speak about the possible future wars.
you. Um, thank you very much. I'm also glad that your organization has been documenting um, some of these human rights violations for the record. And I think documentation has been, you know, one of those um, hard areas to do, especially in the thick of the crisis, for you to be able to say, hey, we have these numbers and we've documented these stories, perhaps they could be used as evidence in the prosecution when the dust finally settles. Well, Anna, um, just seeing we have three minutes, I want to invite you now to engage um, a few questions from the panel, uh, sorry, from the audience to say a word or two, uh, and then I would ask you to um, indeed um, coordinate that section. Anna, over to you. Tatiana, are you hearing Anna? No, unfortunately. Anna, we can't hear you. Maybe they should unmute you. Um, yeah, ask the team to unmute you. I think they have unmuted you, Anna. You can speak now. Hello, hello. Oh, is that working? Okay, great. All right, sorry about that. Um, first of all, can I just get everyone to give a quick thank you round of applause to our panelists for their initial thoughts? Thank you so much. And thank you, Solomon, for your excellent moderation as always. Um, as usual, I am going to try to split the questions between online and in person and um, keep a gender balance as well. You guys know I'm big on that. Uh, so I'm going to start today um, with a question for Robert, because I think we didn't have quite enough time to circle back to you, Robert, um, after Tatiana's last point. It was an online question, which is that um, in the past, Uganda has had challenges with documenting human rights abuses in the same way and with the same level of detail that Tatiana is describing um, during the war in Ukraine. So what can be done to ensure that human rights violations are better documented? And perhaps I can add on part of my own, which is, you know, what, what purpose does that serve in advancing the, the cause of human rights? And then if you have a question in the audience, all right, I see you noted and we'll be back. Sure. Thank you very much for that good question on challenges of documenting. You see, if you are a human rights defender or you want to raise human rights issues, you really must, must master a discipline called monitoring. And monitoring is something that you do systematic, that you don't do it on a one. Let me give you a very vivid example. When you hear of abductions taking place, isn't it? Do you hear the full name of a person that Karim Semakula was kidnapped of village zone E, national ID, this, this, and this, or you hear jo Jacob. So you need to get documentation. What for credible, for credibility, for someone to really believe it, you must show that Samson Chiseka of village A, Maki in the Sabagabo zone, whose national ID is this and this number, was kidnapped at 8 p.m in a vehicle similar to a drone of black color with or without registration number plate. That is what we call real information. But to say somewhere, Nyanzi, how many Nyanzis do we have? Many. Credibility. So for you to do it, you really, and that's why document monitoring is very systematic, that you monitor on a daily basis. If someone has been kidnapped or you witnessed it, or so follow it up from that point, until you know, where does he work? At what time was the pick? Can you cross check this information? I think we have a problem where not only human rights defenders, but even other citizens do not want to follow up and say, let's get this documented so that even when we present it to the state, they can't say, we don't know this person. We, 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 we don't know this vehicle. It's not in our system. These cars are owned by different people. Even if vehicles are owned by private individuals, as a state that registers vehicles that come into this country. 
you should be able to know who owns such a vehicle. So documentation is very key and we really need maybe to empower our human rights defenders and ordinary citizens on what does it mean to document and what are you documenting? What are those areas that you really must mark and cross check and verify so that your information is not dismissed as not being credible? Thank you. Um, before we move on, I know, uh, Solomon, this topic's of interest to you as well, and you are a journalist. Would you like to comment at all on that before we move on to the next question? I think Solomon's internet might be giving him trouble. So we'll move on, but we'll give him a chance to comment when he's back. Um, Hakeem, I'm going to give you the chance to ask a question because I remember I skipped over you last time. <laughs> Please say your name. My name is Owin Hakim, a Washington Mandela Fellow, 2021. Uh, my question comes from the observation. We see the people who set up human rights are the people who have the means of doing anything they want. The people who set up the law are the people who have the means of doing whatever they want. And what we see Russia is doing on Ukraine at the global level is what we see happening at the local level. People have the means, even when they violate right, they have the conceptual definition how they define human rights that works for them. It does not work for the certain group of people who are found in the other social economic world that people have been founded by social realities of our life. How do we negotiate about this like as a, people in human rights as a society, locally and internationally, how do we negotiate? Because it has become economic issues. That's what basically I'm talking about when you say you have the means. People have economic means, they violate rights everywhere. Even at household level, we find like people have the means how they violate rights of their housemate. Political level, people have the means at politically and economic level, how they violate lives. If they, they even call us name, but Yawasi, uh, something like that. And for them, they are up there. All this degrading them, they find themselves in an institution. Imagine someone call you Bantu Yawansi, yet hmm? then at the global level, is that what you see Russia is doing? Russia feel like they have a means and they cannot be executed because of their common economic power. They feel like they can move over weak neighbors and violate their rights. So globally, what concept, what concept do you have to engage this? Locally, how can we address this? Thank you very much. Thank you, Hakeem. I can see all your hands, but we're going to give a chance to answer first. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wing Hakeem, for that question. It's true. Who those who have the means have an upper hand, and uh, that's true. Now, for you to change the landscape, as you've put it, requires a lot of sacrifice. Are we together? First of all, you must empower yourself to know what are your rights demand them and defend them you can't demand or defend what you don't know are we together and two i want you to have this at your mind on your mind that human rights have the struggle for human rights have never been a tea party it's not the way you walked and had cookies there that it's there you have to struggle are we together now last but not least the struggle me and you are involved in right now if you want to change the landscape, you are not going to be the beneficiaries of that struggle. No. You are not the one going to change and benefit from that struggle. It's future what? But that journey of 1,000 miles begins with your one step. Are we together? So until you have it, that. Now, those with the high bar can be changed. Nobody knew that Russia by now would not have overrun the whole of Ukraine. Hine as it is. But where there is a determined population, it's very difficult for you to stop them. So it, it takes sacrifice, and that's why you see the Ukrainians have really sacrificed a lot. And that's why the international community is in arms them and said, we will try and support them as much as we can. If they did not have this willingness to sacrifice, they would by now have been overrun. And you can see how they've given Russia a run for its money. So it's about your struggle. Are you willing to struggle? And struggling does not necessarily mean using violent means. No, you can only say enough is enough. 
And we've seen examples of this. I hope I've answered your question, Hakim. The haves can tomorrow be, and they are a minority, but they are not a majority. Thank you so much for that very powerful answer. Um, before we move on, does anyone in the audience have questions for Tatiana so we keep it balanced here? All right, so I'm going to go this young woman behind second row. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kaija Doreen, uh, CD Konitha Author Foundation. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Now, uh, my question to Tatiana, as you've seen uh, gross human rights violations across uh, the areas of Ukraine, and it, it has not been only in Ukraine, we believe that uh, uh, dictators in the world can never stop unless they are stopped. There have been uh, gross human rights, even in the Federation of Russia, by, by the brute ruler that they have today, through their partial mobilization where people who file to join the war are sometimes executed. We've seen execution of uh, uh, civilians, uh, sexual harassment, the killing of young people in the areas of Ukraine. Uh, now, uh, I've been reading the report of uh, the United Human Rights uh, this year, very year, 2022. And we've seen uh, all what has been captured and what has been uh, the victims of the same war in Ukraine. And we still believe that uh, a war in Ukraine, the instability in Ukraine does not only stop in Ukraine, it is also rising over to the world today. So now, uh, as we see the international community like the Amnesty International under Right for Rights, where a few of our members here have participated in writing for a few people who have been victims of the offenders, writing to uh, they question and ask for the release of a few people. Today we want to see, uh, and directly to Tatiana, how, what do you think the international community should be doing much more, should be seemingly be doing, at least to see that there is curb uh, in the violation of human rights today. Thank you. Thank you. Tatiana, over to you. Uh, yes, Kainja, thank you for, for your question. Uh, I think the uh, two things that we need is uh, more awareness uh, uh, in African countries, but not only what is happening in Ukraine and more, more solidarity and more attention to the destinies of people, to the human stories. Uh, uh, because uh, to my mind, uh, this uh, war, Russian-Ukrainian war, is a turning point not only to the European region, but also uh, globally and uh, uh, we uh, basically uh, this war based uh, on the value level as i mentioned uh, authoritarian and like dictators against those democratically elected uh, governments and uh, this uh, should be uh, not uh, allowed you know to this aggression to uh, continue in ukraine we have now the very difficult situation when uh, we have uh, 43 million population in our country and uh, one third of the whole country uh, is displaced because of the war. Uh, half of people are displaced in, inside Ukraine and uh, uh, the next half are refugees in many countries, including my members of my family from Irpini, the city near Kiev, uh, which was attacked uh, by Russians uh, in uh, March this year. And uh, the house actually this was a house where I spent a lot of weekends and where my parents in law lived that was uh, the house was uh, bombarded and partially destroyed by the Russian munition uh, and uh, now the most uh, difficult situation that we have is with those people who are captured by the Russian side with our prisoners of war and civilian hostages, uh, there are tens, uh, uh, th there are thousands of people which are kept uh, by the Russian Federation, including uh, my colleague, human rights defender and co-founder of my organization, Maxim Butkevich, who is now in Russian captivity. And uh, together, as I mentioned, with, with many others who either became victims of enforced disappearances in the newly occupied territories by Russian army, or were political prisoners in Crimea. 
uh, mainly of the indigenous people of Crimea. These are Crimean Tatars, uh, the nation which is Muslim and which is, uh, you know, which was uh, uh, under oppression and uh, deported during the USSR, during Stalin times in 1944. The whole nation of Crimean Tatars was deported from Crimea to Kazakhstan, to Uzbekistan, and then they returned only in the late 80s and 90s. And now they are surviving under the Russian occupation and experiencing the new wave of oppression. So uh, I was uh, on the advocacy trip in October uh, to Nigeria and Ghana, together with other leaders of civil society from Ukraine. And we met many people, uh, the uh, uh, representatives of local authorities, uh, journalists, uh, civil society leaders in Nigeria and Ghana. And what we uh, saw that is a, a very little awareness about what, what is happening in Ukraine, about what happened to Crimea, and people think uh, about the causes of this war in a wrong way. For example, they think that the, the Russia started its war because NATO provoked uh, Russia, which is not true because Russia attacked Ukraine in 2014. And in that time, Ukraine didn't plan to join NATO and NATO didn't want to you know, take Ukraine on board. And majority of the Ukrainian population was against NATO. And we were non bloc country as many African countries are now. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, we as Ukraine are country which voluntarily refused from our nuclear weapon, which we inherited from the USSR times in 1994. We gave out our nuclear weapon voluntarily for the guarantees of our territorial sovereignty. And those countries who were guarantors of our territorial sovereignty were United States, Great Britain and Russia. And just in 20 years, Russia attacked Ukraine after it, which signals it, uh, it is for the rest of the world. It, this is a signal that uh, this is a domination of those who are more who are stronger, who have more powerful, and who can, can just terrify and frighten the neighbors. But I believe that the world which exists on such principles cannot uh, be stable. So we need more solidarity, especially, for example, when I'm speaking at the uh, diplomatic level at the uh, uh, when we speak about the UN resolutions, I uh, was following the uh, Uganda uh, how Uganda was voting, and Uganda it was not supporting the resolutions uh, on Ukraine on Crimea. Uh, so we need more support. So please uh, help us to spread the voice of Ukrainian human rights defenders, Ukrainian civil society in Uganda, in other countries, to explain what is happening, why this war is happening. Help us to undermine the Russian propaganda narratives, which are very powerful, because uh, we uh, don't have such resources, oil and money and gas as Russia has. We cannot, uh, you know, we don't have these big TV channels, Russia Today and all, all others. All we can do is just to speak from ourselves what is happening. Help us to deliver this to the society in Uganda, in, in other countries, and uh, uh, help us to distribute uh, the stories of people who fell victims of Russian aggression and demand their release and demand justice for our country. And help us also to push Niger uh, to push the, the government of, of Uganda and the governments of other countries to support Ukraine at the UN level. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. I'm not sure if you can hear, but you're getting a round of applause over here. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question, um, and then I will give all of our panelists a chance to offer some closing thoughts. So we'll do one more question, and then Solomon, it'll be over to you, and then you guys can share closing thoughts, and we'll wrap up for the day. Um, I'm going to take one more question from this gentleman on the end here who's patiently had his hand up. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Regan Dule uh, from uh, Konetha Foundation. Uh, Tatiana, thank you for fighting for human rights. And we are all human rights activists here. But I don't think uh, there is someone here who has been in the country in the war with the war. The war is so, so difficult. And um, it's hard, actually, to fight for human rights. So I give my uh, respect to her that she's in the country with the war or under the war, and she can still stand and fight for human rights. 
Um, to me, uh, I think differently with uh, human rights. Um, we all uh, fight for our rights and rights for our countries and families and neighbors. But um, I don't think we are doing enough because the people who are violating our rights, um, these are the people who are really uh, connected and they have all the resources to fight for, I mean, to, 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 to violate people's rights. And the people, us, who are activists of human rights, and we don't have enough. And the only body we have is the UN. So to me, I think the UN has not done enough um, to protect us and to protect the world as we think. Because um, even activists, obviously, they have to go to UN. And even if we have a war in our country, we all, we, we all have to go to UN and request for maybe ceasefire or maybe some sanctions. So we are looking at um, the war in uh, Ukraine. Um, I think it's a, it's a financial war because I think that Russia wants to, to fight, to put Ukraine down. Because um, when you have peace, uh, you have love. When you have peace, you you have development. So the love and the development in Ukraine is really uh, messed up and it's 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 really destroyed. So the only um, um, role we have to play as Tatiana and all the world in uh, in ma mainly in Africa, um, don't think that uh, Africans we are not there for Ukraine. Uh, we are, but our dictators are not. So the thing is, uh, we, we, we want all, all the activists in the world to, to have one voice, and we call upon the UN, not through our governments, because if it's through our governments, we're not going to get any results, but through the organizations and foundations and churches and uh, activists as we are, so we can call upon UN to stop uh, what is whatever is going on in the, in the in in Ukraine. Mainly, we can call upon we can call for ceasefire in Ukraine because UN can do that. I've been in a country like South Sudan and uh, Ethiopia. I'm sorry, uh, Solomon is out. I would have uh, shared with him about this. So uh, these countries, we we used to use some activists in those countries, like in South Sudan and in Ethiopia, and we go to UN compounds or UN bases, and we call for ceasefire, not uh, using the government, but using the NGOs and the common people in the refugee camps. We can call for ceasefire, and the war will stop. But if you think that NATO or NATO can stop the war, I don't think NATO can stop the war now, when the, uh, the, the, the states or Ukrainians are out of the country, and you have uh, empty buildings. If you have uh, empty cities, uh, then no one, no one can stop the war in an empty city. So it's only UN who's supposed uh, to defend the, 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 the refugees or the, the common people in, uh, in, in Ukraine, or they go back to their homes and they protect them in their homes. That's when we shall stop that war. Thank you. All right, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I know we just got one more question in the chat as well. Solomon, are you with us or is your internet uh, giving you trouble? Okay. I was really excited about the internet connection at the beginning, but it looks like it may have failed us temporarily. Um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna give a chance to um, both of our panelists to say some parting words. And then we will wrap up from there. Um, as always, we welcome you guys to spend time, hang out. Um, if you haven't completed the feedback survey already that's been going around, please make sure you do so before you leave. And I'll be back in just a moment. Uh, Robert, we'll start with you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to give some parting shots. Uh, I know our audience right now here is an audience of young people. And the advantage young people have in this country is that you enjoy something that you don't see as a power of influence, the demographic dividend. The democratic dividend is something you've not used and you, you think that having economic resources, money is important. That's not the most important. It is the numbers that matter. <coughs> the population. Let me tell you one thing. Just do this thing. And that's how we build civic competence in civil society. Know your rights. Demand them and defend them. 
challenge anyone listen what you are doing is it within the law or outside the law just pose that question the moment even a law enforcement has that question from you whether he tries to to suppress your word you know that the person i'm dealing with understands what he or she is talking about are we together when a collective starts asking people are you following the law those people will think twice are we together and you have to be courageous i am not telling you to go and block roads to but i'm not inciting violence i'm asking you to question what someone is doing is this that you are doing within the ambits of the law the way you are treating your fellow human being does the law allow you to do that you will see how someone will get it. two please write an act of injustice don't see an act of injustice and say tebinkwata ko mbado yo munyanko le munne gwe bakuba are you understand stop ethnicizing human rights if a fellow citizens rights are being trampled upon don't try to relate your connection your concern on his or her ethnicity okay just ask the person whoever is, is this allowed under the law the way you're treating is this how you'd want to be treated yourself are we together that movement of questioning of holding people accountability will bring change in this country without those weapons you are talking about money and whatever stop washing worshiping money money also has its own limitations the problem this country has that everybody is worshiping money uh, you are worshiping a money it is now your god and that is where you have lost and that's why the leadership is also using money to do what by you so i want to conclude by this please question hold them accountable when it means holding account i'm not saying use violence challenge the person is what you're doing within the law two please be everybody's keeper stop seeing people's rights being violated or abused i see you see when i hear about kidnaps and ab abductions and here someone just mentioned some i have seen videos where people have time to record a man beating his spouse or his and you spend a whole 15 minutes recording that why don't you record the drone because you are in a position of yes you are in a position to record the drone you're in a position of following up with this person who was kidnapped. Where does he come from? Does the else one chapel? But you just leave things out there and we keep lamenting. The struggle for human rights in this country will only be overcome, done by ourselves. The rest can only assist you, but that struggle is supposed to be internal. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you guys and thank you. Thank you, Robert, for being with us today and all your contributions to the conversation. Um, Tatiana, oh, Solomon's back. Solomon, can you, are you able to talk as well? Uh-oh. I, I have been here. <laughs> I just had uh, removed the video. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, uh, maybe, I, like, you know, I always give my remarks after everyone has spoken. I also have my few... Uh, responses some of those things but tatiana can come in first all right over to you tatiana uh, thank you colleagues uh, i just would like to react uh, uh, on the ceasefire topic and uh, maybe just give my final thoughts and comments uh, on the issue uh, we all uh, dream about the end of this war as uh, every day our citizens uh, are dying uh, and uh, more and more uh, Ukraine is destroyed. This year we expect uh, over minus 30% of the GDP of Ukraine. And uh, some cities uh, uh, are literally erased uh, from the face of Ukraine and bombarded till zero level. And we all uh, dream about peace. But if you speak about this is fire, uh, which, uh, uh, can be assured by the UN, it is not possible because Russia is a permanent member of the UN Security Council and Russia stops and prevents any attempt of the United um, Missions to send its peacekeepers or somehow to end uh, the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, 
as for now, we can uh, only uh, when uh, Ukraine stops to fight, for us it means the end of Ukraine. But when Russia stops its war and withdraws its troops for Ukraine, it means the end of the war. Uh, we need uh, Russia to take back its military forces from the internationally recognized territory of Ukraine. And this is the only solution that can uh, bring peace uh, to our country. Actually, uh, we were quite naive back in 2014 when Russia started its aggression against Ukraine and Russia occupied Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea. There were no military res resistance and Russia did it uh, uh, without uh, resilience from Ukrainian army. And uh, there were hopes that probably uh, there would be the end that Russia stops but of course not. Russia, after it, Russia immediately uh, in spring 2014 started its war in Donetsk and Luhansk people's uh, Luhansk regions and uh, it created these uh, fake uh, so-called people's republics uh, and uh, uh, occupied the part of Donbass. And then it was another ceasefire and uh, the Minsk agreements uh, uh, were uh, adopted and uh, we hoped there would be ceasefire. Uh, but of course not, it uh, didn't stop Russia because Russia wanted to destroy the uh, all Ukrainian statehood and to control all the state of Ukraine, not only Crimea and Donbass. And then in eight years, Russia continued its aggression and uh, uh, the results are already devastating. So it's an illusion that if we have a ceasefire now, it helps to stop this war. No, because Russia will use this to mobilize more soldiers, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, prepare more weapons, because now they are being defeated by Ukrainian army uh, from day to day because they even don't have enough uh, uh, like military men and equipment to continue uh, its uh, uh, to, to continue continue their offensive. So only solution to it is that uh, Russia will be defeated and Ukraine will win, and Russia uh, takes back its troops from the territory of Ukraine. And the peace formula for the sustainable peace for Ukraine uh, concludes four elements. First, as I said, it's a liberation of all Ukrainian territories, which were taken by the Russian army starting from 2014. Second, it's a guarantee for security for Ukraine that Russia will not attack us again. And the, uh, the, the biggest guarantee for our security at the current moment is when Ukraine joins NATO. Now the support, uh, the, the majority of Ukrainian population supports uh, Ukraine joining NATO, which was not, as I mentioned, was not before uh, 2014, before Russia attacked Ukraine, we didn't want as a, as a country, we didn't plan, didn't want to join NATO. The third element of peace is bringing to accountability all war criminals, uh, starting from soldiers who committed war uh, crimes on the battlefield and ending with a, uh, top leadership of the Russian Federation and Russian President Vladimir Putin, who started this aggressive uh, war in Ukraine and who are masterminds who are behind these uh, atrocities happening uh, on our territory. And fourth element of the sustainable peace is the restoration of Ukraine. We now have, as I said, huge losses in our economy, uh, people's lives, uh, destroyed uh, plants and destinies, property, everything. At the moment, uh, the assessment of Ukrainian go uh, government of the uh, losses during this uh, invasion are uh, in between uh, 500 and 600 billion US dollars. This all has to be paid by Russia to restore uh, Ukraine as a country and to pay uh, uh, contributions to the victims of the uh, Russian armed aggression. Only when we have this all done, these four elements uh, of uh, peace formula, we will achieve the security and sustainable peace in our region. Thank you. Thank you. Can we give one last big round of applause for Tatiana as a thank you for her contribution today? And Solomon, we turn it over to you to offer your final thoughts and close us out for the evening. Yeah, Tatiana, thank you very much. Um, um i i hope yeah so 
very much and uh, our guest today, Robert, uh, for that. This is, I, I, normally when I'm, when I'm hosting Dignity Dialogues, I also give my thoughts. Um, so I, I don't, I remove the jacket of just being a moderator, but I also get the opportunity of just speaking my heart out. I think what we have seen in Uganda, let me start with Uganda, then I can go to Ukraine. I think what we have seen in Uganda is a lack of accountability um, and, 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 and a lack of accountability people who are supposed to be held accountable. People who beat people every single day. It is on record. People have been beaten, people have been abducted, people have been killed right before our own eyes. And what is happening is that many of us are sliding into the spiral of silence because we fear. I can tell you, very many times I've wanted to challenge this government and I, like with like putting up a tweet and you know some of my loved ones are like but Solomon no don't do it you have a young family you you know these people will come for you and all the threats that come along and I'm sure all of you have heard that that sometimes your your family sometimes you just say you know what no I will not take this in let me just do it whether they arrest me or not I think that it's time for us as Ugandans to get out of that fear and stand up and defend and speak up against human rights violations. Why? Because today it may be that person who has been abducted and nails removed and beaten and, and battered and bruised because you're comfortable in your own home and in your own space and none of your relatives have been arrested or, or battered or butchered. You, de you, you, you decide to keep quiet and slide into a spiral of silence. I think that we cannot go on like that. As Ugandans, we must be concerned if someone has been battered or if any human rights violation has been committed. Because if we keep quiet, then we will let all these bad guys continue to do what they're doing. Let us use everything in our powers to push back against human rights violations. As a journalist, I can only do something. What are you doing about it? Don't only look at Robert Chirengas, the human rights defenders who have put their necks out there to fight for us. I think it takes more than the human rights defenders. It takes all of us. All of us have a role and a responsibility and a duty to push back on human rights violations. So quit just talking about it, do something about it. If you hear a campaign going on, go ahead. If you have evidence, bring it up, bring it up. If you've recorded a video, let it go viral. Let us name and shame people who commit these atrocities. Let's hold government accountable. If you're in public spaces, stand up and actually speak up against these things. Because if you don't, no one will speak out for us. The Americans are just presenting us a platform to express ourselves, but the duty of us to defend ourselves and push back on human rights violations is upon us as Ugandans. So I want everyone in the room to understand that if you decide to keep quiet about these things, then it will, no, it, it will come knocking on your door. And the worst thing that, you, that could ever happen is when it knocks on your door and all of us keep quiet, right? So for me, as a Ugandan, as a journalist, I will continue doing my role to hold the powerful accountable, to speak up against social evils that are happening in our societies. And I refuse to be quiet about the wrong things that are happening in my country. So that's just me. And on the issues of, 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 of Ukraine and the violations that are happening, I really want to think that as Ugandans, we can pick a leaf from the Ukrainians. I think that they have remained united. They have remained solid. They have pushed back. They have collected evidence. They are presenting evidence to the International Criminal Court. They have been part of a system to push back on the aggression of Russia. And I believe that one day, just one day, someone will pay for what happened in Ukraine. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but because of the strong people, women and, and men and children who have stood their ground and have come up and pushed back, I think one day, just one day, one day for the millions of lives that have been buried in mass graves, for the bloodshed of the 400 plus kids that have been, that has been shed, innocent bloodshed, for the grandparents, parents who have died, for families that have lost their loved ones, for the millions of people that have left Ukraine to go into neighboring countries, there's nothing as bad as being a refugee when you're not part of the cause of that situation. I believe that globally we should raise our voices and stand together with Ukraine to push back on Russia's aggression. I have this, when people commit atrocities, we cannot just say 
that we are neutral. And I think I would want to state it again. It was wrong for Uganda to stay neutral when it was when the opportunity came for it to stand up and vote against the invasion of Ukraine. It was wrong. It was wrong for the government, President Yoram Museveni, to stay neutral in this because now he actually means that you're standing with the oppressor. And I will say that over and again. Uganda stood with the oppressor. Uganda stood with Russia. You cannot stand neutral in a situation where hundreds of thousands of lives are being lost. It is unacceptable. There's times when journalism cannot be, you know, and people have said that sometimes I'm always one-sided. Sometimes in places and times of human rights violations, you take a stand. You need to stand up and be counted and belong somewhere. So for me, as a person, I will always say that what, happened, what is happening in Ukraine is bad and it cannot be tolerated. So whichever you call yourself, I think we cannot continue like this. We need to stand up and raise our hands and be counted. Thank you very much. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Solomon. Um, I think I would have a really hard time following that. So I'm just going to say thank you to everyone once again for being here. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Solomon. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, thank you, everyone who's joined us today for your incredible questions and engagement, as always. We are taking a little bit of a break for the holiday season. So our next and final dialogue will be in mid-January. So you can expect an email from me after the new year. Um, in the meantime, I want to wish you all a very uh, happy holidays and hope that you have a restful um, next month or so. And I look forward to seeing you in the new year. Um, thank you. Those online, feel free to drop off at your leisure. And um, thank you once again. Thank you.